Tuesday at 7 p.m. W5FC. L110.9. I need to make myself very clear. If we uplink now, Skynet will be in control of your military. But you'll be in control of Skynet, right? That is correct, sir. Skynet.
Okay, we're looking for a net control over on Echo Link. I'm not seeing her. Let me look down the list here real quick. Hmm. All right, well, I'll tell you what. I'll go ahead and open the net. We'll be waiting on Miss Billy, KFI PDS. She is our net control for this evening. So uh, keep an eye on email and the such. And the like. This is KE5 ICX. I'm actually alternate net control for tonight's Skynet. But I'll go ahead and start up the net, and we'll see if we can get her in here. Does anyone need to use the repeater before we begin tonight's Skynet? All right, this is Kilo Echo 5, India Charlie X-Ray. My name's Tom. I'll be your alternate net control this evening for the session of the DARC Skynet. Skynet is a weekly net called every Saturday night at 9 p.m. concerning the subject of astronomy. Our purpose is to help amateurs become more familiar with the nighttime and daytime sky, astronomy, and space in general. This net is open to all amateurs interested in this topic, and we encourage your participation, comments, and suggestions for this net. Stations priority or emergency traffic may enter the net at any time by using the pro sign, break, break, and your call sign. Is there any emergency or priority traffic? Please come out. Transmit without, ah, she's there. We found her. Uh, yes, uh, I'll finish the preamble and then you go ahead and take it. Uh, this is a directed net. Please do not transmit without direction from net control. And that would be, well, I'm alternate net control. And stations are reminded to ID at the end of your transmissions. This weekly net operates on this frequency, which is 146.880 megahertz with a PL tone of 110 decimal niner. Check-ins via Echolink are also possible using the W5FC-R station ID or Echolink node 37247. Tonight's topics, astronomy charts, pictures, and live audio video links are available online. You can go to W5FC.org right now for a complete list. And remember to tell others about this popular net. All amateur operators are welcome, and you need not be a member of any amateur radio club to participate. This net is 90 minutes long. It's structured in several parts with general announcements, Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas events, where and when you can look through a telescope, discussion topic of the evening, what you can see in the sky tonight, a feature constellation or object, recent astronomical discoveries, space exploration and space history, visible satellite passages over the next couple of days, astronomical Q&A in the 73 round. I do see Miss Billy on frequency. I'm going to go ahead and start with check-ins, and then Miss Billy, uh, you can take it after that. I'll hand the net back to you. So let's go ahead and start with low-power short-time check-ins. Please come now with your call sign name, where you're transmitting from. Let me know if you're low-power or short-time. Low-power short-time only, please. Foxtrot 5, Juliet Hotel Alpha, Chaz Mobile, short time. Kilo Golf 5, Quebec, Extra India, Glenn Rockwell, short time. I'll go ahead and take those. I've got KF5JHA, Chaz. He's mobile in short time. We've got two checked in. KG5QXI, Glenn in Rockwell. Short time. Any additional short time, low power, please come now.
So let's go ahead and go to general check-ins. If you'd like to join us, please come with your call sign phonetically, your name, where you're transmitting from. This is November 5, Bravo, Bravo, Bill in Irving. This is Kilo 5, Kilo Tango X-Ray, Kelly in Quinlan. This is Kilo 5, Alpha, November, Papa, Allen, and Dallas. This is Whiskey Bravo 5, Oscar Zulu Lima, Brendan DeSoto. Charlie 5, Oscar Zulu Tango, Carolyn and Louisville. Kilo Golf 5, Papa Mike and Richardson. This November 5, Whiskey Oscar India, William and Allen. Juliet, Delta, Whiskey, John, and Coppola. Hey, we have a pause. Let me go ahead and acknowledge the check-in so far. N5BB, Bill Irving, K5KTX, Miss Kelly, Quinlan, K5ANP, Allen and Dallas. WB5OZL, Miss Brenda DeSoto, KC5OZT, Miss Carolyn Louisville, KG5P, Mike Richardson, N5WOI, William and Allen, and K5JDW, John and Coppell. Additional check-ins, please come now. Number five, Hotel Yankee Papa, Tom and Irving. This is Kilo, Foxtrot 5, Zulu, Bravo Lima, Bill, Farmer's Branch. Hello, Foxtrot 5, India, Victor, Juliet, Justin, Red Oak. Let me grab those three. I've got N5, HYP, Tom and Irving, KF5, AZBO, Bill and Farmer's Branch. Good seeing you today. KF5, IDJ, Justin and Red Oak. We missed you today. Any additional RF before I move on? RF check-ins only. Please come now. November Tango 5, Tango Mike, Tony and Dallas. All right, I've got NT5TM, Tony in Dallas. Good to see you today as well. All right, I'm going to move over to Echolink, and then we'll do one final round after that and kick off the net. Echolink, if you'd like to join us this evening, please come now with your call sign and uh, your name and your location. This is Kilo, Bravo, Five, Romeo, Hotel, Echo, Brian, Fort Worth.
Okay, we have WW2CBI, Ron in Fairview, and KB5RHE, Brian in Fort Worth over on Echo Link. If anyone else is on Echo Link, I'll give you another chance. Uh, otherwise, just type in uh, that you would like to be recognized over on the chat box. Echo Link only, please. Hearing none, we'll go ahead and continue. I'm going to go ahead and give the net back uh, to uh, Miss Billy. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh boy, here we go. Uh, Cat5 PDS. This is from KE5 ICX. The net is yours. Hey, thank you very much, Tom. Welcome to everybody on Skynet. Thanks for checking in. This is KF5 PDS Billy, your net control this evening. I have a center engine out from this dang flu, but I am go on the other four. So it looks like we just had our glitch for this mission. All right, so let's get started with general announcements. Do we have any general announcements for this evening's net? These can be ham, astronomical, space, or of general interest to licensed hams. Tango 5, Tango Mike. NT5TM, Tony, good evening. Uh, what news do you have for us this evening? Tony, yeah, I've got this flu bug on the run. I've already been through the Tamiflu, and I'm on the downside. I'm just still not 100%, so thanks for the well wishes, and best of luck to you in avoiding it. Um, it has been pretty awful this season. All right, thank you for those great announcements. Uh, does anyone else have any announcements for this evening's net? If so, please come now with your call sign. All right, not hearing any other announcements, so I'll give some uh, announcements of my own. Uh, the AMSAT Radio Amateur Satellite Group has two nets available to Dallas residents on Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. Central Time. You'll need Echolink installed and you registered. You can find the net under Groups and AMSAT. Also, a live audio link is available on their website at www.amsatnet.com. 
This net originates in Houston, Texas. The Dallas AMSAT net, Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas, is every Wednesday at 9 p.m. on the Arlington repeater, 147.140 megahertz, with a PL tone of 110.9 and a positive offset. And as was mentioned before, uh, DARC has several nets on Monday nights. Uh, the first Monday of the month is Ham Fixin's net. If you like to cook, eat, uh, want to share a recipe, anecdote, talk about food, have a question about food, uh, bring it to Ham Fixin's net. Uh, second Monday is MCOM 101, Emergency Communications. Third Monday of the month is the second helping of Ham Fixin's net. So if you didn't get enough the first Monday, come back for the third Monday and you can share more recipes and uh, do more uh, talk about food. And as Tony said on the fourth Monday, come geek out on the geek net. Uh, we've talked about, you know, as Tony's mentioned, so many key things. So if you bring it, if it's geeky, uh, they'll discuss it. So join Tony for the geek net on the fourth Monday. And if there happens to be a fifth Monday, we do fifth Monday surprise net. Uh, we've done everything from uh, April Fool's Truth or Lies to Christmas Thunderdome sharing best and worst Christmas presents and loads of Jeopardy and last time I think they uh, did a uh, create a short story on the fly with different uh, participants so uh, which I believe you can read in the newsletter so there's all kinds of things going on on Monday nights with the DARC net on Wednesdays uh, Veterans Net is first and third week from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Time and Saturdays is the night of nets, with TechNet going from 7 to 8 p.m. And, of course, at 9 p.m., SkyNet. The ARRL Net, National Traffic System Training Net, is every night at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. And all are welcome to check in on any or all of these nets. And as Tony mentioned, tonight's Afterglow movie. Remember, Afterglow movie net will be this evening at 1030, immediately following Skynet with about a five-minute break. So uh, join us for the most amazing movie of the 1950s, the 4D Man in 4D. That's right. 3D wasn't enough and never will be when telling a science fiction story of so much depth, 4D depth. You'll believe you can put your fist through a wall just like you did in college, only with less pain. You'll see scientist brothers working together to solve the universe's biggest mysteries, and it's all in 4D color. Join us for the next trans-dimensional movie of all time, The 4D Man, 1959. The Afterglow movie tonight at 10.30 p.m. Bring your 4D glasses. And you can keep up with all the DARC events, nets, and activities by going to the club website, w5fc.org. All right, next segment up is Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas, uh, where and when you can look through a telescope. So if there's anyone on frequency that would like to talk about Texas Astronomical Society, please come now with your call sign. K5 KTX. K5 KTX. Kelly, good evening. Uh, what announcements do you have for us this evening with Texas Astronomical Society? Thank you, Billy. This is K5 KTX and the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas has monthly meetings every month on the fourth Friday of the month, except for November when it's the third Friday. And usually in December we don't have a meeting at all. These meetings are held at the University of Texas at Dallas campus in Richardson. The meeting begins at 7.30 p.m. in the Science Learning Center building, which is SLC or Sierra Lima Charlie on the campus map. The best place to park is in Lot H, where we have now been given permission to park in orange, gold, or green spaces after 5 o'clock p.m. on Friday. You can park anywhere else as long as you choose a green space, otherwise you risk getting a ticket. The meeting includes programs presented by members or guest speakers and a slideshow of the current constellation of the month.
We did have a meeting last night, and it was a wonderful meeting. We had a presenter from uh, a professor at UTD who talked to us about exoplanets and the different methods that are used to, um, to locate exoplanets and some of the latest research that's going on in that field. Very interesting stuff. And also, it was kind of fun because he's very enthusiastic about the topic. So. Um, so he probably could have talked to us all night about that. We also had our own Chaz, KF5JHA, who did a, a great presentation with Dennis on the Constellation of the Month, which was Jim and I, the twins, and um, some great things to look at in that particular constellation. Also last night and every, every other month, we have a beginner astronomy class, and last night at 7 o'clock, uh, we learned uh, about different uh, preparation of your equipment for storage and transport. Lots of things to think about. Um, for example, our dark sky site up in Atoka, Oklahoma has uh, sometimes, just kidding, a tendency to uh, bring us dew on our equipment, and so just some best practices for how to get rid of the dew and how to store the equipment after your, your gear is completely drenching with the dew. Um, so next month will be the um, orientation. So we have a new member's orientation, and then the, the next month after that, we'll have another beginner astronomy class. Now, unfortunately, as of this uh, as I'm talking to you now, I've not been able to get an answer as to what the presentation will be next month. But again, those meetings are on the fourth Friday, and the meeting and speakers are always wonderful. They are free and open to the public. In addition to the monthly meetings, the Texas Astronomical Society also hosts observing parties every Saturday night beginning at around sunset and concluding at 10 or 11 p.m., just depending on um, the time of year and the weather and so forth. Um, each week is a different location for observing, so make sure you get the complete details for the Saturday night you wish to attend, and you can go to texasastro.org and click on the calendar tab at the top and um, take a look at the calendar and see all of the, um, all of the events that we have coming up. So finally, after days and days and days and days of rain, um, I think it's a little bit clear outside. However, tonight's star party, which was uh, the uh, uh, Stars on the Rock at Lakeshore Point, it was canceled because the field where they set up was just completely soaked from the last rains that we've had for, it seems like, forever. And so the star party was canceled for tonight. Next Saturday will be the first Saturday of March, and it, the star party, weather permitting, will be at the um, Spring Park in Garland, which is off of Jupiter Road. Second Saturday of the month is at Frisco Commons Park. Third Saturday is at J.W. Williams Park in Cedar Hill. And we're back to the fourth Saturday, which again is at Lakeshore Park in Rockwall. In addition, if you go to our calendar, you might see, see some additional events, star parties that are available, um, that are open to the public. And, um, for example, in March, on March the 20th, we have the Farmer's Branch Star Party, which is held at the Farmer's Branch Historical Park. It's a really nice park. And um, so we will have that starting on March the 20th. The backup date will be on Thursday, March the 22nd. And it's a great central location. They do turn out the lights, and it's a wonderful opportunity to look through telescopes and see all the interesting stuff that you can actually see in the Metroplex. I think that's about it. Uh, be sure to go to texasastro.org and take a look around. And um, lots of great information on that website about how to buy a new telescope and so forth. And I think that's all I've got. Billy, this is K5KTS. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, and as she said, go to texasastro.org to find out details about star parties and telescopes and uh, upcoming meetings, et cetera. There's loads on the website. So thank you very much, Kelly. All right, next up is our uh, 
MCS topic of the evening. So for topic tonight, I have chosen the National Radio Quiet Zone. So the information uh, that I'm presenting tonight is pulled together from uh, the article on Wikipedia and also from science.nrao.edu, which is the National Radio Astronomy Observatory website. All right, so the National Radio Quiet Zone, or NRQZ, is a large area of land in the United States designated as a radio quiet zone in which radio transmissions are heavily restricted by law to facilitate scientific research and military intelligence. It was established by the FCC in docket number 11745, dated November 19, 1958, and by the Interdepartment Radio Advisory Committee, the IRAC, in document 3867-2, dated March 26, 1958, uh, to minimize possible harmful interference to the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, or NRAO, in Greenback, West Virginia, and the radio receiving facilities for the U.S. Navy in Sugar Grove, West Virginia. Today, the NRAO oversees the Quiet Zone in agreement with the Sugar Grove facility, and the Quiet Zone protects the telescopes of the NRAO facility and the antennas and receivers of the U.S. Navy's Information Operations Command at Sugar Grove. The NIOC has long been the location of electronic intelligence gathering systems and is today said to be a key station in the Echelon system operated by the National Security Agency. And the area has also attracted people who believe they suffer from electromagnetic hypersensitivity. The quiet zone is approximate rectangle of land, 107 miles on the north edge, 109.6 miles on the south edge, and 120.9 miles on the east and west edges, comprising approximately 13,000 square miles. It straddles the borders of Virginia and West Virginia and also includes a sliver of Maryland. The NRQZ is centered between the Green Bank Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia, and Sugar Grove Station in Sugar Grove, West Virginia. It includes all land with latitudes between 37 degrees, 30 minutes, 0 0.4 seconds north, and 39 degrees, 15 minutes, 0 0.4 seconds north, and longitudes between 78 degrees, 29 minutes, 59 seconds west, and 80 degrees, 29 minutes, 59.2 seconds west. Most broadcast transmitters in the core of the quiet zone are forced to operate at reduced power and use highly directional antennas. This makes cable and satellite all but essential for acceptable television in much of the region. Restrictions on transmission are tightest within 10 miles of the NRAO and Sugar Grove facilities where most omnidirectional and high power transmissions are prohibited. Not all radio transmissions are prohibited in the core of the radio quiet zone. For example, emergency service such as police, fire, ambulance, radios, and citizens band radio are permitted. However, large transmitter owners must typically coordinate their operations with the NRAO. The only broadcast radio stations are part of the Allegheny Mountain Radio Network with just one station in the AM band and several low power FM stations. Exceptions to restrictions are usually determined on a case-by-case -case basis with preference given to public safety concerns such as remote alarm systems, repeaters for emergency services, and NOAA weather radio. The most severe restrictions imposed on the general public are only in place within the 20-mile radius of the Green Bank Telescope. The NRAO actively police the area for devices emitting noticeably high amounts of electromagnetic radiation such as microwave ovens, Wi-Fi routers, and faulty electrical faulty electrical equipment and request citizens discontinue their usage. They possess no legal powers of enforcement, although the FCC can still impose a fine of $50 on violators, but will work with residents to find solutions. Cellular telephone usage in the core of the zone is also highly restricted. In Green Bank, though, the rules are even stronger, so much that people there can't use cell phones, Wi-Fi, or even a microwave oven. 
The Green Bank Interference Protection Group maintains policies to manage radio frequency interference by dividing it into five zones based on available legal instruments. Zone 1 and Zone 2 are located within the property of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. The entire NRAO property is designed as Zone 1 except small portions such as housing, visitor, and laboratory areas that are des designated as Zone 2. Zone 1, also called Radio Astronomy Instrument Zone, restricts intentional radiators to only those that are deemed essential. All unintentional radiators must be operated within the ITUR RA769 recommendations on protection criteria used for radio astronomical measurements. Gasoline-powered motor vehicles are forbidden within Zone 1 as the ignition system on spark-ignited engines generates noticeable radio interference, resulting in all vehicles and equipment needing to be diesel-powered. Zone 2, also called uh, Observatory Building Zone, allows intentional radiators licensed by the National Radio Quiet Zone, but not other radiators such as Wi-Fi, cordless phones, and wireless equipment. Certain types of unintentional radiators are allowed. Zone 3 and Zone 4 are governed by the Radio Astronomy Zoning Act, which is the Chapter 37A of the West Virginia Code. It strictly regulates radio transmitters within 2 miles and 10 miles of the NRAO facility, respectively. Within these zones, the interferences to observations will be identified and documented. The owners of the offending equipment will be personally visited to request cooperation in eliminating the interference. Enforcement is used as a last resort. Enforcement in Zone 4 may be more lenient than the limits set in Chapter 37A. Zone 5 is the boundary of the National Radio Quiet Zone. The enforcement policies for this zone are managed by the National Radio Quiet Zone Administrator at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. NRQZ coordination is required for all new or modified permanent fixed licensed transmitters inside the quiet zone as specified for federal transmitters by NTIA Manual Section 8.3.9 and for non-federal transmitters by the FCC in 47 CFR Section 1.924. The applicable radio services include, but are not limited to, public mobile, wireless communications, maritime, aviation, privately and mobile, personal radio, fixed microwave, international fixed public, satellite communications, radio broadcast, experimental radio, auxiliary and special broadcast, cable television relay, amateur radio, personal communication services, and general wireless communication service. Geographic area license services are not exempt from the NRQZ coordination. Applicants for some radio services are required to file their applications through independent frequency coordinators such as Association of Public Safety Communications Officials, American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, and Wireless Infrastructure Associations. The coordinators assume the responsibility of notifying the Interference Office that an FCC application has been filed and hold the application until the Interference Office responds with its evaluation. Coordination under the West Virginia State Code, Chapter 37A, the Radio Astronomy Zoning Act may also apply. There is a very detailed coordination process. I won't go into all the details, uh, but I'll mention the website again if you wish to look in, into that and look at the details of coordination. But in order to minimize harmful interference to the op operations of the NRAO and Green Bank and the Sugar Grove Research Station, all requests for new or modified permanent fixed, assigned, or licensed transmitters within the quiet zone shall be coordinated with the applicant prior to submission to the FCC or NTIA with the National Radio Quiet Zone Administrative Office at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. The reference point for calculations of transmitter power density is the prime focus of the Green Bank Telescope. The location of the Green Bank Telescope prime focus is latitude 
38 degrees, 25 minutes, 59.2 seconds north, and longitude 79 degrees, 50 minutes, 23.4 seconds west. Ground elevation is 2,644 feet above mean sea level and height of 458 feet above ground level. Based on a 20 kilohertz measurement bandwidth, the calculated power density of the transmitter at the reference point should be less than 1 times 10 to the negative 8 watts per meter squared for frequencies below 54 megahertz, 1 times 10 to the negative 12 watts per square meter for frequencies from 54 megahertz to 108 megahertz, 1 times 10 to the negative 14 watts per square meter for frequencies from 108 megahertz to 470 megahertz, and 1 times 10 to the negative 17th watts per square meter for frequencies from 470 megahertz to 1000 megahertz, and frequency squared in gigahertz times 10 to the negative 17th watts per meter squared for frequencies above 1000 megahertz. Except for frequencies that reside in the radio astronomy ob observing bands listed in the U.S. table of frequency allocations in which case the power densities listed in this table uh, recommended ITUR RA769 applies. As a service to applicants who are planning to install transmitters within the National Radio Quiet Zone, the National Radio Quiet Zone office can evaluate proposed transmitter installations long before an applicant decides upon a final transmitter location or equipment configuration. These preliminary evaluations can help the applicant determine the best location for a transmitter while keeping National Radio Quiet Zone interests in mind and can ultimately expedite the application process. The result produced by the preliminary evaluation is the maximum power that can be radiated by the proposed transmitter towards Green Bank. Requests for preliminary evaluations should be submitted to the NRQZ office and should contain name and address, radio service, and for each proposed transmitter, frequency or frequencies, signal bandwidth, if unknown, this information can be gathered from the technology type or the emission designator, antenna location in latitude and longitude to the nearest second, antenna site ground elevation above mean sea level, and antenna height above ground level. The NRQZ office reviews all applications to ensure that the computed power flux density at the reference point does not exceed frequency dependent thresholds. In some instances, the power, transmitter power requested by an applicant exceeds the level that is harmful to observations in Green Bank or Sugar Grove. When this occurs, Applicants should discuss possible modifications to their transmitters, for example, using a directional antenna, relocating the antenna to an area that provides additional terrain shielding, or selecting a different frequency where the power density limits are different with the interference office. In our experience, a technical solution can almost always be found to provide the area coverage desired by the applicant while simultaneously minimizing the impact of interference upon Green Bank or Sugar Grove. In the extremely rare case when differences between the applicant's desires and the interference office's evaluation cannot be resolved, both the applicant and the interference office should forward comments or the transmitter installation to the FCC or IRAC for a final resolution. And it's emphasized that the interference office has no authority in the granting of an FCC license or a federal government frequency assignment. The Interference Office only has the privilege of submitting its comments on a particular transmitter installation to the FCC or IRAC. And any applicants who feel that their applications have been evaluated unfairly or inadequately can contact the Office of Green Bank Site Director for review of the circumstances. And again, uh, there is a very detailed uh, description of the coordination process. There are several different coordination processes, I guess, depending on the situation. And if you're interested in reading more about that, you can go to the website science.nrao.edu to read more details. And also, if you're interested in you know, putting up equipment, they give contact information, uh, and names and phone numbers, addresses and such. So you can really delve into the details there. 
So uh, there's my uh, talk about the National Radio Quiet Zone. At this time, I'd like to ask if anybody has ever visited the Quiet Zone, and if anybody would like to give some firsthand accounts of their experience there, I'd welcome that. So if you have any uh, experience visiting the National Radio Astronomy Observatory or being in the National Radio Quiet Zone, please come now with your call sign. Okay, it was about as quiet as the quiet zone, I imagine, so I guess uh, nobody has any first-hand account they'd like to relay, which is cool, just thought I'd ask. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed uh, that segment. All right, this is KFIPDS. Uh, Billy, your net control for the DARC Skynet. So at this time, uh, I'd like to turn the net over to my alternate net control, Tom, KE5ICX, if you'll see if we have any additional check-ins, and then give our report on what we can see in the sky over the next couple of weeks. Good. Thank you, Ms. Billy. This is KE5ICX, alternate net control for this evening. I'll go ahead and take additional check-ins. If you'd like to join us this evening, please come with your call sign name and where you're transmitting from. What you can see in the sky this evening, uh, we've got two things here, one from EarthSky.org and then one from the U.S. Naval Observatory. So we'll start with EarthSky.org. By the way, the links are on uh, the website. You can go to W5FC.org and you'll find all the links there. There is a picture that says south to overhead this evening, uh, and it shows the winter circle, and this is what we're talking about this evening. So as the waxing gibbous moon shines inside a large asterism that we in the northern hemisphere often call the winter circle. It's a very large star configuration made of brilliant winter stars. Around the world on this night, the moon is inside the circle. From anywhere in the northern hemisphere, look for this pattern to fill up much of the eastern half of the sky at nightfall. By mid-evening, the winter circle will swing to your southern sky, and then it will drift into your western sky at around midnight. You're in the southern hemisphere, although it's not winter for you. These same stars appear around the moon. But for you, the circle will appear upside down with respect to our chart. The star Sirius will be at the top instead of at the bottom. The winter circle is sometimes called the winter hexagon. It's not one of the 88 recognized constellations, however. Rather, it's an asterism, a pattern of stars that, that's fairly easy and uh, to recognize. Uh, our sky chart doesn't adequately convey the winter circle's humongous size, that's his term. It dwarfs the constellations of Orion the Hunter, which is a rather large constellation occupying the southwestern part of the winter circle pattern. I'll also show uh, another picture of the winter circle directly, just another uh, representation of it with a triangle between Betelgeuse, Procyon, and Sirius. So here's how we locate the winter circle from mid-northern latitudes. At nightfall and early evening, we'll high overhead for the bright star Capella. The star marks the top, or more properly, the northern terminus of the winter circle. As, as Capella shines way overhead, the constellation Orion the Hunter is crawling in the southern sky. You draw a line downward through Orion's belt to find Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky. The star marks the bottom, or the southern tip, of the winter circle as seen from our northern hemisphere perspective. Way, tonight's waxing gibbous moon, shows you where the sun resides in front of the backdrop of stars in late June or early July. 
also enjoy the winter circle and contemplate the sun being in this part of the sky when summer returns to the northern hemisphere. So the bottom line is, on the evening of February 24th, the waxing gibbous moon shines inside the huge pattern of stars known as the winter circle. Be sure to notice the different colors of these stars. This is from the U.S. Naval Observatory. They talk about what you can see in the sky this week. Some's already passed. Some has begun. So we got a little bit of rerun here. The moon climbs into the northern reaches of the ecliptic this week, arcing, arcing through the bright stars of the Great Winter Circle. First quarter occurs on the 23rd at 3.09 Eastern Standard Time. That's 3.09 a.m. This is one of the best times to observe the moon from the northern hemisphere since she's at her highest altitude while going through her most eye-catching phases. Watch the Terminator line slowly advance from night to night, revealing the succession of interesting terrains and formations. Then uh, there's some uh, uh, details on the 20th where you see would have seen three prominent craters near the Terminator. The Phyllis is the most complete and partially superposed on a similar sized uh, Coriolis. Both of these craters sit just to the north of the large crater Katharina. You can get a evolution of lunar features by looking at this area. Uh, Theophilus, I hope I said that right, is obviously younger than Coriolis, or Katharina is older still. Uh, Theophilus was formed in the uh, impact of a modern, modest-sized asteroid over a billion years ago, which is considered to be recent in Luna's geological time scale. At 61 miles across and over 13,000 feet deep, it is one of the most striking features on the moon. Terraced walls and complex central peak are in the main features, but also notice how its south western wall it hinges on the three and a half billion year old Cirillus. The astronauts of Apollo 16 sampled some of the ejectrum from Theophilus, finding some of the oldest rocks blasted from the more ancient lunar dust. Luna's brightening orb scatters more and more light as the week advances, but you will still enjoy the bright stars of the great winter circle. Orion stands just below the moon on the evening of the uh, on the evening of the 24th. This should be a night, fine night to use your small telescope to not only explore the moon's jagged features, but also look for the winter circle's brightest stars. Star with, start with Betelgeuse, the red, reddish-hued star that marks the hunter's right shoulder, and then move southwest to the icy blue Rigel. Both stars are hundreds of light years away, which means that they are thousands of times more luminous than the sun. Counterclockwise from Rigel, you'll pass orange-tinted Aldebaran, Golden Capella, the close double star pair of Castor, Pollux, Whitest Procyon, and ending up with a blazing blue glow of Sirius. Uh, compared to Orion stars, the rest of the stars in the winter, winter circle are all relatively nearby. Castor is just 50 light years distance, while Sirius is a mere eight and a half light years away. You can use these stars to play an interesting game that I call birthday stars. If you're eight and a half years old, the light from Sirius originated there when you were born. Procyon light is about 11 and a half years old, and so on. As I can guarantee that nobody on the planet today has one of Orion's brightest stars as their birthday stars unless they are a giant redwood or a tree. You can start looking for Venus, oh, and then moving on to the planets, you should start looking for Venus in earnest in the twilight after sunset. You should be able to pick her out just above the western horizon about half an hour after sunset. She'll climb higher in the west as springtime approaches. Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn are now well arrayed for pre-dawn sky watchers. You'll find old Jove near the meridian on an hour before sunrise. By the end of next week, he'll rise at around midnight. But the best time to give them a look is still in the wee hours. Buddy Mars courses eastward between the stars of Scorpius and Sagittarius. He is gradually brightening as Earth 
slowly starts to catch up to him on our faster intersolar orbit. His disk is gradually getting larger as a result, and owners of large telescopes should start monitoring his surface details. Saturn is low in the southeast, hanging out just above the top of the teapot asterisk in the Sagittarius. All these planets will be best viewed in the spring and summer months. Um, that's it from me, Miss Billy. Uh, this is KE5 ICX, back to that control. Great, thank you, Tom. Yeah, this is KF5 PDS, Billy, uh, net control for Skynet. All right, uh, next up is our featured constellation. So at this time, I'd like to just remind everybody you can go to the website w5fc.org and follow along with sky maps and notes. And at this time, I'd like to turn the net over to Ms. Carolyn, KC5OZT. The net is yours. Thank you, Billy, and uh, yeah, I hope you do look at the pictures on the website over there, but I'm get a computer trouble. Uh, I'm not doing a constellation. I'm doing a topic tonight that uh, of obser observing, and uh, I'm sure some may be heard about it. I've seen it on Facebook, too, but about an amateur astronomer that captured the uh, supernova's first light. And, uh, and this didn't just happen. I mean, this happened in 2016, but the story is just now really coming out. Uh, let me reset. You know, supernova or exploding stars are unpredictable. But an Argentine amateur astronomer happened to catch one just as it began to explode. explode. It's like winning the cosmic lottery, one astronomer said. Now this is in the galaxy, NGC 613 in Sculptor. And, uh, uh, now, uh, there's one picture of some Santa Cruz astronomers that caught a color image. It was in February of 2017, uh, later, you know, but mine, let me get to the actual topic, though. Uh, some amateur astronomers avidly and routinely search for supernova in distant galaxies. But Victor Busso in Rosario, Argentina, wasn't doing that. When he caught the initial burst of light from the supernova, now labeled SN2016 GKG, instead, he was performing tests on a new camera. As it turned out, a series of photos provided professional astronomers with one of the first views ever of the initial burst of light from a supernova uh, before and after the critical period known as a supernova's shock breakout. The University of California, Berkeley astronomers explained the shock breakout is when a supersonic pressure wave from the exploding core of the star hits and heats gas at the star's surface to a very high temperature, causing it to emit light and rapidly brighten. Um, the Kepler spacecraft called a supernova's shock breakout in 2016, or not this one, but but this sort of capture that this amateur got, the first optical light from a supernova is elusive because uh, 
of course, natural stars that explode, explode see, do it at random in the sky, and this light from the shock breakout is splitting. And professional astronomers afterwards analyzed Buso's photos, and they continued observing uh, this snowball with big telescopes. They said this combination provided them with important clues to the physical structure of the star just before it exploded. And that these clues will help them understand the nature of the explosion itself. And then follow up the uh, observations at the Lick and Keck Observatories. Uh, uh, astronomer said observations of stars in the first moment they begin exploding provide information that can't be directly obtained any other way. And Buso's data is exceptional. And this is an outstanding example of a partnership between amateur and professional astronomers. And the discovery and results of follow-up observations from around the world were published uh, February 22nd in the issue of the journal Nature. And I hope you Look, uh, I think the links are on the website. There's a, a series of four photographs that he took that night at 1.44 a.m. And uh, the location of the supernova. There might be a faint dot, but you can't really tell. An hour later, nearly, uh, uh, about 2.40 a.m., there's a little tiny dot there. At 2.48 p.m., I mean a.m., uh, there's a, the dot is still there, presumably growing. And then 2.57 a.m., um, uh, there it is, a little bit brighter. And, uh, see, this is just in, say, just about an hour's time, just, uh, uh, a rough estimate. You actually see this star get brighter and brighter. And let me reach. The object steadily brightened for about 25 minutes. Is shown in the there's a uh, another panel of, of uh, estimates. Uh, I'm not sure Tom put that on, but this all happened. Uh, Busso caught a series of photos September 20th of 2016, and it's like a lot of have done. Uh, he was using his camera. He was testing a new camera, in fact, on a 16-inch telescope. And he just happened to be aimed toward NGC 613 and, uh, like I said, located in Sculptor. He was taking a series of just short exposure test photographs. photos. Uh, luckily, he examined these images immediately. He didn't wait, you know, a few hours later, but he looked at them immediately, and he noticed this faint point of light quickly brightening near the end of a spiral arm, and it wasn't visible in his first set of images. And, uh, um, I assume he uh, immediately notified uh, astronomers, but uh, prof 
professional astronomers in Argentina soon soon learned of this discovery and realized that how rare, rare this event was that he had caught. Part of the first hour after emerged from the supernova, and this astronomer estimated the chance of such a discovery. At one in ten million, or even maybe as low as one in a hundred million. He immediately contacted an international group of astronomers to help conduct a frequent observation of this nova over the next two months. Some obtained a series of spectra where the light's broken up, of course, in like a rainbow, with the Shane Telescope at Lick Observatory, and the Twin Telescopes at the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. And his team later estimated that the initial mass of the star was about 20 times the mass of our sun, though it probably lost most of its mass to a companion star and slimmed down to about five solar masses before it exploded. So uh, the lesson behind this, if you're um, really experimenting with uh, cameras or uh, observing galaxy, and this has been done visually, I mean, finding supernova or nova in other galaxies, uh, uh, you know, uh, pay attention, you know, and maybe uh, you might make a great discovery, uh, but uh, I'm not... I don't know how many of you are into the astrophotography, but uh, uh, everybody can learn a lesson from this amateur and what he uh, discovered. So, uh, I see if anyone has any questions, Billy, I'll uh, turn it back to you, case 5 oz Great. Well, thank you very much, Carolyn. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Carolyn before we move on? If so, please come now with your call sign. Okay, not hearing any, and you're absolutely right. Uh, you never know what you're going to take pictures of, um, and I've known some folks that have done amateur, like, planetary uh, observing uh, amateur planetary photography and have gotten publishable results, uh, notably George Hall, I believe he took pictures of a Jupiter impact uh, and was able to get some results published. So you never know what you're going to discover when you are out taking pictures and talk about being at the right place at the right time. And that guy made a find of, the, of, the, of a lifetime. Uh, all right, so next up is uh, recent astronomical discoveries. So at this time, I'll turn the net over to Brenda, WB5OZL. The net is yours. Thanks. This is WB5OZL. Uh, I only have one article tonight, and its title is, A Second Thought, The Moon Floor May Be Widespread and Immobile. A new analysis of data from two lunar missions finds evidence that the moon's water is widely dis distributed, distributed sorry, across the surface and is not confined to a particular region or type of terrain. The water appears to be present day and night, so it's not necessarily easily accessible. The findings could help researchers understand the origin of the moon's water and how easy it would be to use as a resource. If the moon has enough water and if it's reasonably convenient to access, future explorers might be able to use it as drinking water or to convert it into hydrogen and oxygen for rocket fuel or oxygen to breathe. 
we find that it doesn't matter what time of day or which latitude we look at, the signal indicating water always seems to be present, said Joshua Banfield, a senior research scientist with the Space Science Institute in Boulder, Colorado, and lead author of the new study published in Nature Geoscience. The presence of water doesn't appear to depend on the composition of the surface, and the water sticks around. The results contradict some earlier studies, which have suggested that more water was detected at the moon's polar latitudes, and that the strength of the water signal waxes and wanes according to the lunar day, which is 29.5 Earth days. Taking these together, some researchers propose that water molecules can hop across the lunar surface until they enter cold traps in the dark reaches of craters near the north and south poles. In planetary science, a cold trap is a region that's so cold, the water vapor and other volatiles which come into contact with the surface will remain stable for an extended period of time, perhaps up to several billion years. The debates continue because of the subtleties of how the detection has been achieved so far. The main evidence has come from remote sensing instruments that measure the strength of sunlight reflected off the lunar surface. When water is present, instruments like these pick up a spectral fingerprint at wavelengths near 3 micrometers, which lies beyond visible light and in the realm of infrared radiation. But the surface of the moon also can get hot enough to glow or emit its own light in the infrared region of the spectrum. The challenge is to disentangle this mixture of reflected and emitted light. To tease it to a part, researchers need to have very accurate temperature information. Ben Witts and colleagues, oh, I'm sorry, Ben Field and colleagues came up with a new way to incorporate temperature information, creating a detailed model for measurements made by the uh, Diviner instrument on NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO. The team applied this temperature model to data gathered earlier by the Moon Mineral Mineralogy Mapper, a visible and infrared spectro spectrometer that NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, provided for India's Chandrayaan. Chandrayaan 1 orbiter. The new finding of widespread and relatively immobile water suggests that it might may be present primarily as OH, a more reactive relative of H2O that is made of one oxygen atom and one hydrogen atom. OH, also called hydroxyl, doesn't stay on its own for long, preferring to attack molecules or attach itself chemically to them. Hydroxyl would therefore have to be extracted from minerals in order to be used. The research also suggests that any H2O present on the moon isn't loosely attached to the surface. By putting some limits on how mobile the water or the, or the OH on the surface is, we can help constrain how much water could reach the cold traps in the polar regions said Michael Poston of the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas. Sorting out what happens on the moon could also help researchers understand the sources of water and its long-term storage on other rocky bodies throughout the solar system. The researchers are still discussing what the findings tell them about the surface of the moon's water. Uh, sorry, the source of the moon's water. The results point toward OH and or H2O being created by the solar wind hitting the lunar surface, though the team didn't rule out that OH and or H2O could come from the moon itself, slowly released from deep inside minerals where it's been locked since the moon was formed. Some of these scientific problems are very, very difficult, and it's only by drawing on multiple resources from different missions that we are able to hone in on an answer, said LRO project scientist John Keller of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. LRO is managed by NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, 
for the Science Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters in Washington, D.C. JPL Design built in manages the Diviner instrument. Okay, this is from uh, ScienceDaily.com. Back to net, WB5OZL. Great, thank you very much, Brenda, for that great report. All right, next up is space exploration and space history. So at this time, I'll turn the net over to Kelly, K5KTX. The net is yours. Thank you, Billy. Um, this is K5KTX. Well, NASA's Mars InSight lander team is preparing to ship the spacecraft from Lockheed Martin Space in Denver, where it was built and tested, to Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, where it will become the first interplanetary mission to launch from the West Coast. The project is led by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. NASA has a long and successful track record at Mars. Since 1965, it has flown by, orbited, landed, and roved across the surface of the Red Planet. What can InSight, plan for launch in May, do that hasn't been done before? InSight is the first mission to study the deep interior of Mars. A dictionary definition of the word InSight is to see the inner nature of something. InSight, which is interior exploration using seismic investigations, geodesy, and heat transport, will do just that. InSight will take the vital signs of Mars, its pulse using seismology, temperature using heat flow, and its reflexes using radio science. It will be the first thermal checkup since the planet formed four and a half billion years ago. The team hopes that by studying the deep interior of Mars, we can learn how other rocky planets form. Earth and Mars were molded from the same primordial stuff more than four billion years ago, but then became quite different. Why didn't they share the same fate? When it comes to rocky planets, we've only studied one in great detail, Earth. By comparing Earth's interior to that of Mars, InSight's team hopes to better understand our solar system. What they learn might even aid the search for Earth-like Earth -like exoplanets, narrowing down which ones might be able to support life. So while InSight is a Mars mission, it's also more than a Mars mission. One key way InSight will peer into the Martian interior is by studying motion underground, what we know as Mars quakes. NASA has not attempted to do this kind of science since the Viking mission. Both Viking landers had their seismometers on top of the spacecraft where they produced noisy data. InSight seismometer will be placed directly on the Martian surface, which will provide much cleaner data. Scientists have seen a lot of evidence suggesting Mars has quakes. But unlike quakes on Earth, which are mostly caused by tectonic flakes moving around, Mars quakes would be caused by other types of tectonic activity, such as volcanism and cracks forming in the planet's crust. In addition, meteor impacts can create seismic waves, which InSight will try to detect. Each Mars quake would be like a flashbulb that eliminates the structure of the planet's interior. By studying how seismic waves pass through the different layers of the planet, the crust, mantle, and core, scientists can deduce the depths of these layers and what they're made of. In this way, seismology is like taking an x-ray of the interior of Mars. Scientists think it's likely they'll see between a dozen and a hundred Mars quakes over the course of two Earth years. The quakes are likely to be no bigger than a 6.0 on the Richter scale, which would be plenty of energy for revealing secrets about the planet's interior. All of NASA's interplanetary launches to date have been from Florida, in part because the physics of launching off the East Coast are better for journeys to other planets. But InSight will break the mold by launching from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. It will be the first launch to another planet from the West Coast. InSight will ride on top of a powerful Atlas V 401 rocket, which allows for a planetary trajectory to Mars from either coast. Vandenberg was ultimately chosen because it had more during InSight's launch period. 
all new region will get to see an interplanetary launch when InSight rockets into the sky. In a clear pre-dawn sky, the launch may be visible in California from Santa Maria to San Diego. The rocket that will lift off, that will waft InSight beyond Earth, will also launch a separate NASA technology experiment. Two mini spacecraft called Mars Cube 1 or, or Marco. These briefcase sized CubeSats will fly on their own path to Mars behind InSight. Their objective is to relay back InSight data as it enters the Martian atmosphere and lands. It will be, the, be a first test of miniaturized CubeSat technology at another planet, which researchers hope can offer new capabilities to future missions. If successful, the Barcos could represent a new kind of data relay back to Earth. InSight success is independent of its CubeSat tagalong. Mars is home to some impressive volcanic features. That includes Tharsis, a plateau with some of the biggest volcanoes in the solar system. Heat escaping from deep within the planet drives the formation of these types of features, as well as many others on rocky planets. InSight includes a self-hammering heat probe that will bury down to 16 feet into the Martian soil to measure the heat flow from the planet's interior for the first time. Combining the rate of heat flow with other InSight data will reveal how energy within the planet drives changes on the surface. Studying Mars lets us travel to the ancient past. While Earth and Venus have tectonic systems that have destroyed most of the evidence of their early history, much of the red planet has remained static for more than 3 billion years. Because Mars is just one-third the size of Earth and Venus, it contains less energy to power the processes that change a planet's structure. That makes it a fossil planet in many ways, with the secrets of our solar system's early history locked deep inside. At this point, the launch is um, tentatively set for May the 5th, 2018, so if you're anywhere near California, that would be, um, that would be really something to see. In space history this past week, starting with February the 18th, back in 1930, American astronomer Clyde Tombaugh discovered Pluto. Clyde took an early interest in astronomy, building his own telescope before his 20th birthday. The detailed observations he made got him a job offer with the Lowell Observatory as a junior astronomer. There, it was Clyde's job to pick a small piece of the sky at a time and then examine each photo in an effort to detect the planet X that astronomer Percival Lowell had predicted beyond Neptune. After 10 months, Clyde discovered the object he would name Pluto. Pluto was considered the ninth planet of our solar system until 2006, when it was reclassified as a dwarf planet by the International Astronomical Union. Who are they to say, anyway? It's still a planet to me. To honor Tom Bowles, Cremated remains were carried along on the New Horizons spacecraft on the long journey to Pluto. They continue to travel with New Horizons out into the Kuiper Belt. And if you've never been to the Lowell Observatory out in Flagstaff, Arizona, it is a wonderful, beautiful campus. And of course, you can see the telescope there that Pluto used to discover Pluto. February the 19th, way, way back in 1473, famed astronomer Nicholas Copernicus, a path-breaking Renaissance astronomer, was born in Poland. Perhaps his greatest achievement was the heliocentric model of the universe, which placed the sun, rather than the earth, at the center. Like many great scientific insights, the heliocentric model was a powerfully simple tool based on data rather than trying to fit the evidence to some preconceived notion that required extremely complex explanations. While his model went widely unrecognized by his peers, it would, in the generations to come, provide a foundation on which astronomers such as Johannes Kepler and Galileo built their work. February the 20th, 1962, at 9.47 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, astronaut John Glenn launched in Friendship 7 on Mercury Atlas 6. He was the first American to orbit the Earth. After the planned three orbits, and with some worry about whether his heat shield was in the proper place, Glenn splashed down near Grand Turk Island in the, in the Caribbean. That summer, Friendship 7 went around the world again on a 30-city tour. The capsule was seen in person by about 4 million people in Europe, 
Africa, Asia, and the Americas over the course of three months. A year after the launch, Friendship 7 landed at the National Air and Space Museum, Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., where it can still be seen today. February the 21st, 2007, it was announced that NASA's sister space telescope had captured enough light from exoplanets to identify molecular signatures in their atmospheres. Spitzer obtained the spectra for two exoplanets, HD 189733b, which resides in the Vopacula constellation 370 trillion miles away, and HD 209458b, 904 trillion miles away in the Pegasus constellation. These planets are known as hot Jupiters because, like Jupiter, they are gas giants, but they orbit much closer to their respective stars, making them much hotter than the gas giants in our solar system. Scientists were surprised to find that the data indicated that the planets were much cloudier and drier than predicted. The use of Spitzer spectrograph to identify molecules in the atmosphere of a planet so far away was a major achievement. It was also a significant step toward being able to detect signs of life on other planets. On February the 22nd, 2006, the Hubble Space Telescope discovered two new moons of Pluto. The first evidence of the moons came in observations in mid-2005, but it took follow-up observations in mid-February 2006 to confirm the findings. Astronomers using Hubble's advanced camera for surveys found that the newly discovered moons, later named Nix and Hydra, orbit on the same plane as the already known and much larger moon Charon. This finding added evidence for the theory that the moons of Pluto were born from a collision between two Pluto-sized objects over four billion years ago. In 2011, a fourth moon of Pluto, Kerberos, was announced, and then in 2012, a fifth one was discovered and named Six. February the 23rd, 1987, astronomers first spotted the supernova they would go on to call Supernova 1987A. The Titanic supernova is the brightest since 1604. And finally, on February the 24th, 1969, Mariner 6 launched. Mariner 6 and 7 comprised a dual spacecraft mission to Mars, the sixth and seventh missions in the Mariner series of spacecraft used for planetary exploration in the flyby mode. The dual mission flew over the equator and south polar regions, analyzed the Martian atmosphere and surface with remote sensors, and recorded and relayed close-up pictures of the surface. A primary objective of the mission was to establish the basis for future investigations, particularly those relevant to the search for extraterrestrial life, and to demonstrate and develop technologies required for future Mars missions and other long-duration missions far from the Sun. The Mariner series of probes established the foundation of our knowledge of Mars, allowing us to progress to where we currently stand, with two operational Mars rovers, another rover to be launched in the 2020s, and a crewed mission to Mars planned for the 2030s. And that's all I've got. This is K5KTX. Back to you. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Kelly. Uh, certainly a lot going on with space exploration and space history. All right. Um, looks like we're getting pretty close on time. So uh, let's see. Well, we have a little bit of time. So at this time, I'll turn the net over to Tom, KE5ICX, if you'd like to do a minute or two about the satellite passages and see if we have any final check-ins. This is KF5PDS, Net Control for Skynet. Goodness, Billy, I'll do exactly that. I'll go ahead and take check-ins, and I'll go ahead and give the announce uh, the uh, count. So if we have additional check-ins, please come now with your call sign name and where you're transmitting from. I have KG5 
YBO, David, in Dallas. Okay, let's see here. We have uh, visible satellite passages or passes over the next couple of days. The ISS has a couple of good ones. We had one on February 25th. We have minus 3.7 magnitude at 6.21 in the morning out of the southwest. Reaches highest point at 6.24 at 79 degrees, and then it will fall at 6.27.52 local time. So that should be a pretty good pass. There's a second one on February 28th. The 28th, I should probably pop this on the screen here, is a minus 3.8 magnitude. It's at 5.24 a.m. Uh, this one's coming out of shadow, so it'll be midway through its path until you see it, so it'll be almost directly overhead. Uh, 524.31 is its highest point, and then uh, it'll end at 527.31. That's on February 28th. And I'll give uh, Tian Gong one has one pass February 28th that looks pretty good. It's a point one magnitude at 19:33 local time, reaches its highest point at 9:35 at 78 degrees, and it falls at 9:35.42. So that one looks like a fairly good pass. Uh, again, this one also goes into shadow. Uh, this one goes into shadow rather than coming out of shadow. Uh, so you could check that one out as well. So uh, those are probably the only ones I'll give you. Uh, some of these others are very dim, probably be difficult to see. So your best ones are the two for the ISS on February 25th and 28th. As always, you can find this information at heavens-above.com. That's a hyphen between heavens and above.com. And uh, you can uh, plug in your longitude and latitude there and be able to do all sorts of remarkable things. So I'll send it back to you. Uh, Ms. Billy, this is KE5ICX. Uh, we got 19 check-ins so far this evening. All right, copy that. Um, yeah, you can put in your own GPS uh, coordinates into the Heavens Above website, and there's all kinds of other cool things to explore on the site as well. And if you have not seen an International Space Station uh, pass, uh, you owe it to yourself to do it. It is really remarkable to see uh, to see it pass by. I always wave. So, um, and copy that we have 19 uh, hams participating on the air tonight. All right, so we'll go ahead and wrap up the net. So thank you to all who checked in this evening. And we hope that you will join us here next week and every Saturday night at 9 p.m. to discuss astronomy, space, and space exploration. On this net, the sky is never the limit. We're always looking for net control stations for this and all the other DARC nets. If you would like to try your hand at this, contact any of the net controls by sending an email to nets at w5fc.org. You can follow topics and discussion about this net and astronomy in general on Facebook and Twitter, as well as our audio and video streams, video archives, and other useful internet resources by going to w5fc.org at the conclusion of this net. So until next Saturday night, this is KF5PDS, Billy, and I'll be closing the net at 22.29 local time and returning the repeater to normal amateur use. 73 everyone and enjoy the evening discovering the universe and remember coming up after this net is the afterglow movie net where tonight we'll be discussing 1959's the 4d man all right 73 everyone Miss Billy, excellent net as always. So we're going to take five, actually about four and a half minutes, and we'll come back. So um, go freshen up and return for tonight's movie, The 4D Man.
All right, we'll go ahead and get started now. Boy, what a long day today. We had the lecture and lab this morning that went to the repeater site and then did a couple of nets, and now it's 10.30, yay. So uh, I may fade on you. So be ready to take over the net at any moment, any one of you. This is KE5ICX, and I'll be sort of the net control for tonight's Afterglow movie net. So our movie tonight is The 4D Man from 1959. Uh, this is, uh, I'll give you a little description, then I'll go ahead and take check-ins. Uh, if you want to take some notes, that's fine. Um, bring them together. Uh, let's see here. We had it's 1959 film from an independent producer. American science fiction filmed in color by Deluxe, produced by Jack H. Harrison Harris from his original screenplay, and directed by Irvin Yeworth Jr. Don't recognize those, those names, but the stars I do. We have Robert Lansing. You may remember him as Gary Seven from Star Trek. Lee Merriweather played uh, Catwoman in the Batman movie, and James James Congdon. Don't know who he is. Film was released by Universal International. Won't give you. It's got extensive notes in here as far as the plot. I'll just give you the first paragraph or two. It says, "Brilliant, but irresponsible scientist Tony Nelson, played by James Condon, develops an electronic amplifier that he hopes will allow any object to achieve a four." fourth dimensional state. While in this state, any object can pass freely through any other object. Tony, however, fails to pay attention to the overlord, which sparks overload, which sparks an electrical fire that burns down his lab. I've heard this story before. This results in the university terminating his contract. Now an employee, Tony seeks out his brother, Scott, played by Robert Lansing, to help him with his experiment. Scott is a researcher working on material called carganite, not corbonite, carganite, that is so dense that it is impenetrable. He is underpaid and unappreciated at his new job. He does not have the necessary drive to ask his employer, Mr. Carson, for greater recognition. Scott has become the driving force behind the development of Carganite, named after Carson, who is now taking much of the credit for Scott's work. When his girlfriend, Lee Merriweather, falls for Tony and enraged Scott, steals Tony's experiment and starts playing around with it, eventually transforming himself into, you guessed it, a 4D state. When demonstrating this to Tony, Scott leaves the amplifier power turned off, yet he successfully passes his hand through the block of steel. Scott can now enter a 4D state via his own will. Tony is amazed, but warns Scott not to reveal his ability until he can further test for possible side effects. goes on after this, you'll find all sorts of really interesting stuff or not. Some of the other people in this movie, Patty Duke, but I don't think it's the one we're thinking of. She plays Marjorie Sutherland. Uh, Guy Raymond, don't know who he is. Bunch of other people. Uh, okay, well, enough of that. what I'll do, I'll go ahead, I'll tell you what, I will take Echolink check-ins first, they deserve it. Uh, anybody over on Echolink who would like to join us this evening, please come now with your call sign name, where you're transmitting from. I'm going to put you at the very top of the list. Kilo. Bravo, Five, Romeo, Hotel, Echo, Brian, Fort Worth, did not see the movie, just going to listen out. This is Kilo, Foxtrot, Five, Papa Delta, Sierra, Billy, and Sherman, and I did see the movie.
I got KB5RHE, Bryant, Fort Worth. He's going to listen in. He did not see the movie. Uh, Brian, if you have any comments, just say break, and we'll get you in there. But I will not call on you unless uh, you wish to be called upon. But thank you for joining us. KFI PDS, Miss Billy, our net control for Skynet this evening. She did see the movie. She's in German. Anyone else over on Echo Link, please come down. We can come back a little bit later. Just chat. Uh, type something in the chat box if you are interested or want to be recognized. I'll take low power short time check-ins. Anyone who would like to join us this evening for um, for the Afterglow movie tonight's movie, The 4D Man. So I need your name. I need your call sign, your name, and where you're transmitting from. Please let me know if you saw the movie or not. Five, Julia, Delta Whiskey, John, and Coppell. Short time. I will be listening in off and on, but I uh, have not seen the movie. I'll just, uh, don't call on me. I'll just be listening in the background. K5, JW. I have K5 JDW, John and Capel. He's listening in, did not see the movie. If you hear something you want to talk about, John, just just break in. All right, I will take regular check-ins. You know the drill. Please come with your call sign name, where you're transmitting from. Let me know if you saw the movie. Charlie Five, Oscar Zulu Tango, Carolyn and Louisville. I didn't get to see the movie. This is in five Bravo Bravo, Bill and Irving. I did see the movie. This is N five HYP. We saw the movie. Whiskey Bar 05, Oscar Zulu Lima, Brenda, and I did see the movie. Foxtrot 5, Tango, Sarah Kilo, Burl and Dallas, I did see the movie. Go ahead and grab those folks. We have KC50ZT, Miss Carolyn in Louisville. Uh, you did not see the movie. I think I know why. I got your computer. I'm sending it back your way tomorrow. N5BB, Mr. Bill and Irving, yes, you saw the movie. N5HYP, Tom and Company, yes, you saw the movie. WB50ZL, Brenda, you saw the movie. KG5. YBO, David, no, you didn't see the movie except for a small portion of it. If you have any comments, just let us know. Uh, KF5TSK, Burrow and Dallas, it's good seeing you today, and thank you for doing Being Net Control. I listened in for TechNet. Yes, you saw the movie, so very good. Anyone else, anyone new would like to be recognized, anyone who may not have seen the movie but would like to participate in the conversation, uh, please come now.
Hey, don't worry about it. We'll come back to you. If you think of something, by all means. A uh, couple of little housekeeping things before we get started. Remind everyone, uh, think about this. We may have a little bit of a discussion towards the end. We are planning a trip, and I forgot to mention this during the Skynet uh, portion, uh, portion of tonight's net, that we are uh, having are planning a field trip to uh, Houston on, I believe it's March 10th. Uh, the second Saturday of March. Uh, the Apollo 11 uh, command module is on display at the uh, Houston Space Center there, or the Johnson Space Center. Uh, it has on permanent display the Apollo 17 command module, uh, which you can also see the uh, Star Trek shuttlecraft Galileo, as well as a whole bunch of space artifacts there that are really cool. But the main goal is uh, the Apollo 11, um, which will then go on, I believe, to um, Seattle after it uh, finishes its tour here in uh, Houston, which ends uh, sometime next month. So we want to get there before it disappears. If you're interested in going, you can either go to the Afterglow movie uh, web page or, or uh, Facebook page, or you can send a note to info at w5fc.org and we'll intercept it there. Plan is to leave the Dallas area from uh, 6.35 and 35 at around between 6 and 7 a.m. We'll head down there. It's about a four-hour journey. We will carpool. We've got four people already going. There will probably be more. So if you're interested, I'll be with another vehicle, I think, and then we'll, uh, we'll work it out. Of course, use our radios and coordinate. So there will be four hours down, three hours at the location, an hour for lunch and other sundries, and then four hours returning us around 7 p.m. in time for the regular nets and probably collapsing. So that will be in two weeks. If you're interested, just let us know, and we will continue to coordinate. Also, when I was asked to tell everyone we still need, uh, if you're a member of the Dallas Amateur Radio Club and you haven't paid your dues, please do so. It helps pay the bills for the repeaters and phone lines and all the fun communication stuff that we do. So don't forget to do that. You can do that online. Go to w5fc.org and you'll find out how to do that. Okay, let's see here. Let's go ahead. And uh, we got around to check-ins. Our first thing we can do is talk about plot. So I'll call upon the folks who have checked in this evening. I also check Echo Link too periodically. And Miss Carolyn, oh well, you're, you're not having the best of days with that. Um, I'll just keep an eye out over here to make sure things are are good. So let's start with KSI PDS, Miss Billy, over in Sherman. What did you think about the movie? What did you think about the plot? We'll start with that. And then if you get any additional comments, we'll, we'll go ahead and take those as well. So you, you go ahead and lead it off. Uh, Camp 5 PDS from KE5 ICX. Okay, great. Good evening, Tom and everyone on the net. Uh, yeah, I first saw this movie when I was about 14. It had come on television. That was really interesting because I had not heard, you know, delved into much any anything about the fourth dimension. But uh, it was cool to see the movie again. Uh, you know, plot, it was it was good. It was okay. Uh, there was times when it dragged just a little bit for me and uh, kind of lost. Uh, lost focus uh, towards the, about the last 20 minutes. I guess I had to go back and rewatch part because I, I missed something. Uh, but you know, overall, I thought it was it was a good story. It moved well, and it, it just lagged in some parts. Um, and sometimes the you know I had to go back and listen to some dialogue again just to make sure I was following what was happening. And then at the end, it seemed to end so abruptly that. I was I had to go back and just kind of roll it back about 20 minutes and watch through to the end to see what happened. Uh, so there were some times when I kind of lost a little bit of focus, uh, but other than that, it was a good story. I like Robert Lansing, uh, and I thought it was 
just the story. It was a very good story and obviously very interesting and something that hadn't been done as far as any of the other 50 sci-fi that I'd seen at that point. So um, to me, I thought, well, it's a fresh, fresh concept for the time. And uh, of course, not a lot was known about that sort of thing. Not like, you know, we have delved further into those kinds of dimensional things now. And, uh, but I, I, I thought that the, the plot was good, uh, except for a few lags. So, uh, with that, I'll reserve other details about acting and, and other aspects for later rounds. So I'll throw it back to you. This is KF5TDS, back to Matt. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Billy. Kind of uneven, but okay. Got it. Let's see. Next up on who saw the movie. We'll go ahead and go to N5BB, Mr. Bill over in Irving. What did you think of the plot on this fine film, Bill? Being Tom of Group, this is N5BB. First, I would like to remind everyone that a week from today is the Irving Ham Fest at the Bingo Hall in Irving. Be there or be square at 8 a.m., next Saturday, March the 3rd. So, now that I've got that out of the way, I actually liked the movie. I agree with Billy. I thought it was a little uneven in parts of the plot. Um, I thought most of the acting was good enough. I didn't think there was anything really horrible. Um, I thought the special effects, again, you may be talking about this in general, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this up just generally uh, uh, when you talk about the, the general, my uh, general ideas about the movie and the plot, I thought that the special effects and that part of the plot were actually okay. What I thought about the plot that was kind of uneven was the personal relationships. Um, I mean, right at the start of the movie, there was kind of a... Uh, a rebus as um, the evil <laughs> Roy Parker was trying to hit up on uh, Linda Davis, Lee Merriweather, and um, and then uh, her just very abruptly uh, leaving Dr. Scott and and taking up with Dr. Tony seemed a little bit abrupt. It's kind of like she. She switched her allegiances awfully fast. I also think that a common plot thing from the 50s and 60s tended to be the character that got badly affected by the science fiction and became somebody that everybody was chasing, kind of a Godzilla figure, you know, or the uh, Colossus Man or the 80-foot ant woman or whoever. And uh, so that was just kind of a common plot that they tend to repeat in most of these science fiction films, where near the end of the film, they're all chasing the, what's then the evil character, which was originally a very beloved character at the start of the movie. Anyway, in general, I think it was good. It's our BB. Good. Thank you, Bill. We'll see how that uh, plays out with everybody else. N5HYP, Tom and Company. What did you think of the film? What was the collective hive mind on this one from KE5ICX? KE5ICX, this is N5HYP. Yes, we did see the movie. Um, um, the general consensus was, yeah, it started weird, it started slow, it did take um, a better turn later on as we got into the movie, um, and and um, as um, so th in that regard, it was pretty good. Um, I, I we'll talk about some other things later on, but I gotta tell you the music. Nuts. 
it was a 1950s, late late 50s uh, bebop beat type jazz, and it was loud and it was it was um, overbearing and it it uh, distracted from the story in a lot of ways. I think they were trying to be cool and modern and hip in some sort of way. Uh, interestingly enough, I'm sure Tom, you're going to mention that the uh, producer, the director, uh, were the same folks that brought us the Blob from the year before, and uh, so it was an interesting, uh, uh, in interesting combination again. Um, Plot-wise, yes. I, again, I, I believe that yeah, you know, the storyline was was interesting, um, but like Bill, I will agree that, um, you know, the 50 sensibilities as far as the um, uh, relationship between the sexes uh, was very evident here. Um, you know, the uh, right at the beginning, um, you had something that would have been a, uh, definitely a candidate for the Me Too movement, and then you had uh, the, uh, the uh, victim in the Me Too movement becoming the, uh, the aggressor. <laughs> the aggressor character. Um, that was uh, that was just kind of strange uh, in the way that played out. And um, I'm not sure necessarily that we needed that or that was needed to uh, drive the story along, but there it was. So I tell you what, I'll reserve some more comments on other aspects as we go along. Back to that. This is N5HYP and the group here. Very good. Thank you, Tom. Oh, I think we got more to talk about. WB5OZL, Miss Brenda, I know you saw this fine film. What did you think about the plot? This is WB5OZL. Uh, it has good points. It has bad points. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting concept. I didn't like the ending. I thought that was just a total cop out. Um, but um, I, I didn't quite understand why we went from uh, scientific discovery of uh, being able to, to uh, penetrate this uh, solid block with some other object, and then suddenly it's a mind trick. I kind of didn't understand how we went from uh, that transformation so quickly. Um, that was the real Polly Duke. Um, in, in a sort of a cameo appearance. I don't know if it was her first role or not. Um, the music was kind of quirky. Uh, that beatnik jazz from the 50s. I was kind of expecting to see Audrey Hepburn and Leotard dancing and uh, people playing bongos and reciting poetry and drinking uh, coffee and smoking and reading horrible poetry. Uh, so in this is it kind of didn't fit with the theme of the movie, but it certainly fit with the, the times. Um, the, uh, well, I'll have more comments for later about characterization. WP Pablo Zeto. Very good, Miss Brenda. We'll move on to KF5TSK Burl. What did you think of the plot? Uh, this KF5TSK, one of the things I thought about this is uh, Robert Lansing. Uh, I kept thinking, you know, Twilight Zone, you know, this is a Linton movie, you know, very good color. Uh, you know, not much... Uh, uh, I guess studio or props or anything, it's just, uh, uh, but, you know, I just kept going back to him that, uh, uh, Twilight Zone had a lot of the, uh, uh, multi-dimension type, uh, uh, you know, 30 minute, uh, pictures and, uh, that was my thoughts on it, can't find TSK back to net.
you can do whatever you want. You can, you can say, yep, I agree with all your comments as though I had actually combed through all of this ahead of time and agreed with you. Um, I had a little more trouble with the film only because I, I found the plot plotting. And I have a tendency at times to drift when I'm watching a film and I start looking at the crazy stuff in it. So one of the things that I found strange about the plot I don't know if it's a plot or not, but the uh, uh, at Fair, was it Fairchild Industries, they got one guard. He's there day and night working, working the thing, and then he ends up uh, inside every once in a while when he's not directing traffic into and out of. I guess he was on his 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 break or something, and at the commissary. And then the next thing you know, he's directing people around the building there at Fairchild. So I got to tell you, they must have really cheap security there when they only got one guy working the working the day and, and night shifts. Uh, having Robert Lansing there, I agree. It's kind of cool. Lee Merriweather as well. Uh, both uh, nice uh, actors, uh, rather convincing. Robert Lansing, the uh, young, uh, uh, the quirky, uh, you know, uh, self. Uh, uh, defining uh, character through the whole thing. That's that's what he's been known for throughout the years. Story, I I agree with uh, Brenda on this one. I found it kind of strange that we go from science to weird stuff. Uh, that all of a sudden he can do this on his own. There's no explanation as to why. That seemed really odd to me. I just didn't understand how that could suddenly be. Uh, through the magic of motion pictures, I guess. And I had a problem with, I always do, anytime I see anything that says the end, followed by a question mark, we want to make a sequel? Well, I'm not so sure. What happens to Robert Lansing? He goes into the into the, the vault there, and, and we never see him again. What does that mean? That's just a weird ending. But like we talked about, I think sometimes what happens with these things is, is that I really think they run out of ideas for that fifth, fifth act or fourth act, and or they run out of film or both, and then suddenly we have this unsatisfying ending, and that's what it felt like to me, kind of unsatisfying. That's all I got on this round myself. We'll go back to the top of the list. Think about. Uh, let's go with, all right, uh, we, we did talk about it a little bit, but it's the elephant in the room. Uh, this may be a quick round, but let's talk about the music. What did you think of the fine music in this movie? Uh, let's start with KFI PDS, Billy. What did you think of the music? Yeah, I'm glad we're starting with the music because this was probably the biggest problem I had with the movie. Um, at first, I liked it. Yeah, like Brenda said, it was that cool 1950s beatnik jazz. Uh, but then it got real annoying real fast. Uh, whoever did the music, uh, I mean, it was good music. Don't get me wrong. I like that kind of 50s jazz, but it didn't seem to go with the movie at times. There were times when the music and, well, several times when the music and the dynamics and the note, you know, the punches and the music just did not line up. And it sounded like the same music being used over and over and over and over again. Uh, and there were times when it was annoyingly loud over dialogue, which to me it's just like if somebody just randomly hitting that music button or what. Um, it, it, it did, it, to me it was just like one note, this detective music, what I would deem like the kind of dragnet detective music, although dragnet is excellent music, uh, and excellently used, but here the music, it was just like the same tune just being used over and over and over again. Um, the, the music could have had, there were times when it should have been more incidental, uh, to build mood and to reinforce the suspense and the action. And there were times when it matched up appropriately, but lar by and large to me it did not. So uh, I just uh, didn't agree with the, the way the music was used. I liked the music, uh, but I just thought it was horrible used. 
Uh, so with that, I'll return it to you. This is KFI's PDF, back to Matt. Hey, very good. I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of additional comments that follow that same line of reasoning. So let's find out. Let's go to... Uh, the next up would be Bill and 5BB. What did you think of the music? This is in 5BB. <clears throat> the music did not bother me. In fact, the more I think about it, I can't remember the music. <laughs> so um, it was didn't bother me, but I don't remember it as being good. I mean, it's something that aided that helped the movie or anything. So I cannot find, I've been looking around on the web on IMDb, I can't so far find anybody taking credit for the mu music. I see the director, the writers, the stars, I cannot find any, unless I'm missing something, I can't find anything about the production crew and the, and the, uh, the music. So I'm wondering if they just had some kind of stock music they dumped in there. I don't think it was written for the movie. Uh, it's Habibi. Okay, Bill. All right, Bill. Well, I can tell you're not a music aficionado, at least in motion pictures, because uh, I definitely noticed it. That's why it was number two on my list of things to talk about this evening. Uh, music is written by Ralph Carmichael. Uh, that's on the wiki site. And there is no hot link to anything else he did. So Ralph Carmichael is the guy you want to look up. Good luck with that. And I've got comments on that coming along here in a little bit. N5HYP, Tom, I think you were the first to really bring this up. What do you want to say about the music in this fine film. This is KE5ICX. Okay, this is N5HYP. Um, yes, I did. It brought the fact that the music, you know, just kind of drove me nuts because of the style. Ralph Carmichael, if that is the person I thought, I, I, I thought about, he um, was, um, uh, became a big name producer in the uh, Christian music realm. Um, in the 60s and 70s, and that would make some sense because apparently the director, um, if you read the IMDb uh, reviews, Tom, uh, the director was um, uh, a guy who was involved in a small film production company in Pennsylvania that had been doing some um, religious um, uh, films, and the producer really liked him, and he ended up, remember, the same director directed the blob and then directed this one. And um, so um, uh, that kind of, uh, that's, that's what I know of Ralph Carmichael. May I make um, a, a plot comment, though, because um, it was brought up by a couple people, and um, I want to throw a point in. Okay, by all means, go ahead, Tom. You know, the question was brought up, I think it was Billy or, or, or one of them, of, of uh, Brenda, um, how we ended up going from, you know, the, the, the science discovery thing to the, um, to the weird mind stuff. Well, remember, Dr. Scott goes to the doctor, and he's having a checkup. The doctor makes comments that uh, his brain waves are really strong, and um, then um, Dr. Scott finds out about Dr. Tony's, um, you know, uh, a concept about um, using amplified brain waves to um, do this four-dimensional state. And Dr. Scott realizes that, oh, um, I can do, you know, that I can do this too. And he thought he was doing it with the amplifier, but the amplifier was, was broke or not working. And that's when he realized, I have all this power. I can do things with this power. So, um, and the fact that he's not been recognized um, as being the one who was really the one developing the Corganite, uh, the impenetrable stuff, 
Uh, one of the points was that um, uh, here this uh, company was developing this impenetrable material, whereas Dr. Tony had developed a way to penetrate the most impenetrable material. So it was an interesting juxtaposition of things. And you had, um, uh, again, a moral play here in that when a person had um, uh, developed so much power um, that um, he um, uh, was willing to sacrifice his morals um, um, in order to uh, get the recognition and the power that he, that he desired. So it kind of makes sense with the type of uh, directorial crew that we had here. Let's send 5HYP back to that. My goodness. Uh, let me acknowledge Tom there. Uh, okay, got it down. Uh, KG5P, Mike, go ahead. Okay, good evening, Tom and Tom and Tom and Tom and everybody. Yeah, I was going to have listening. I was working on a new antenna that I'm trying to design, another infant dipole. Uh, yeah, Ralph Carmichael. He, he worked with uh, Nat King Cole. In fact, he was involved in uh, Last King Cole in uh, the last album. And he also did stuff for The Lucy Show. Uh, he did uh, arrangements for Ella Fitzgerald, Bing Crosby, Stan Kenton, Peggy Lee, Julie London, uh, El Martino, Roger Williams. He also uh, did, uh, did the score for The Blob, and he also composed and conducted the theme for My Mother the Car, probably one of the most for forgettable sitcoms ever made, KG5P. Very good, Mike. And you know what? And now that you mention, I saw the name and it looked vaguely familiar to me, and I couldn't figure out where. And that name has passed by on the credits. Should have known. All right, very good. You're in the queue, by the way, so I'll come back to you in a little bit. So if you're still awake a little later, I know you're staying up late tonight. So let me go down the list here. Next one is WB5OZL. Miss Brenda, tell us about your your thoughts on the music to this fine film. Well, um, I just like the music. As far as jazz go, it was just fine. Uh, I, I do agree that at times it was just a little too perky for what was going on in the screen. And it, it just didn't seem to jive up with the, uh, with the action or, you know, the, the storyline. Um, I... Perhaps they just had music and they just stuck it in there and didn't bother to compose it to go with the movie. I don't know. It would be interesting to find out. Um, but, um, well, I mean, that's about all you can say about the music. So I'll have more for later. wb 5 Interesting. Okay, next, KFI TSK. Oh, what'd you think of the music? This KFI TSK. I really like the music, but uh, as some, as many have already said, it, it seemed like the the music didn't fit the scene. It was just kind of thrown in there, uh, haphazard, and. Uh, Just didn't have any, you know, relation to what was going on. Can't find TSK back to that. It's very good. Well, um, I, I'll tell you, I've seen this before, and I think we've all seen this in movies before, and I think it was touched upon in the last round, or maybe it was this round, but one of the things that that ends up happening is, is you end up tracking and looping music, the same music over and over again. And this happens when you 
either mismatch whomever it is you're going to do, the, uh, whoever does the music, or you don't have enough money. Let's say in this case you got a jazz quartet, it sounds like, and they're there uh, producing the music and they do a few sets. Maybe it's something standard sets that they did. I don't know. Or it was specially written for the film. Maybe Ralph uh, had some good ideas here. But in the end, either the movie got edited so many times that the music couldn't be looped properly, or they just simply recorded the music and then just put it in place. Whatever it is, it, it, it's obvious if you spend some time and you're watching the film, you'll see that unlike regular movies where you'll uh, have things like Mickey Mousing, they call it, let me reset. is a term that was used and is still used today in, in movies where the music follows the action. An example would be going up a flight of stairs and the music goes up as you go up the stairs. That's Mickey Mouse. Or if you were to jump down onto a lower uh, floor or off a rock or something, the music would then do a, an abrupt drop in tone, that sort of thing. Uh, it, it follows, and then uh, somebody mentioned pacing and beat. That's true, too. If you don't have that, then it, 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 it takes you out of the movie, similar to like seeing the telephone number 555-1212 as somebody's phone number. You know that's not real, uh, at least not in the sense of how the film is. It takes you out of it. And that's what happened to me. It, was, it took me out of the film when that happened. And each time it did, it was cool in the beginning, Billy mentioned that, and then after a while it just gets annoying. Well, I think one of the things, uh, I, I, another film, and if you want to see a really terrible movie, and this one isn't in science fiction realm, but it has one of our favorite science fiction uh, type actors in it. There's a movie called The White Comanche with William Shatner playing two characters, a Comanche warrior and a, and a cowboy. And it has jazz music in it. And it's terrible. It came out in 1968. Uh, he did it in the summer between uh, Star Trek up, uh, seasons two and three. It's hard to find this film. And there's a reason why. Most of them have been buried in landfills. This is, this is the film that came to mind when I was watching uh, The 4D Man for the first time, which is this weekend. So uh, I, I, it's exactly the same thing, queuing up the same music over and over again. But then I digress. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Music's my thing when it comes to movies, and I just thought I'd mention that. Could it have been done better? Was it good music? Yeah. Could it have been done better? Oh, yes. It certainly could have been. Alrighty, um, I'll tell you what, let's go to special effects and then we'll open it up after that. So we'll go back to the top of the list here. We'll go to uh, Camp 5 PDS. Miss Billy, were the special effects uh, good enough for you? Did you like them? Uh, could they have been better? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, special effects I thought were were okay. Uh, I don't have any anything really to uh, d nothing disparaging comes to mind. Uh, I thought it was you know good special effects for the times. Uh, interesting, you know, being able to show putting your hand through uh, a solid block of metal. I like the fact that they the first time it happened, it was very abrupt. You know, like. You know, he was pushing the rod through, and it was like he slipped, and then his hands in there. And I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, oh, whoa, you know, oh, my God, his hand is in the block. So I thought that was very well done. Uh, I, and there was the suspenseful moment where he is, has a duck behind the table uh, with the, his hand in the block waiting for the guy who comes in and, like, sneaks a couple of pages off of the top of the desk there. And, you know, so it's suspenseful because you know that's got to be hurting him uh, and getting his hand out of the block. So I thought that was well done. Uh, and then, of course, at the end, yeah, whenever you have a the end with a question mark, uh, I was kind of like, eh, yeah, cop out. But uh, when he was going through the blocks, he was going through the carganite at the end, 
uh, and it was he was doing it, but with great difficulty. I thought they did that very well to show that you know there was some effort there. Uh, he wasn't just moving effortlessly through materials all the time. So I thought they made it you know believable, you know where you could suspend disbelief. Uh, so on the whole, I, you know, I, I don't have any any problems with the special effects. I thought it was, you know, for the times they were they were good, uh, and it was, you know, such an interesting concept that uh, I don't think had been done in previous sci-fi movies up to that point. So it was original. So um, I liked the special effects. So this is KFI PDS back to net. Thank you, Ms. Dewey. This is KE5ICX. Let's go to KC5OZT, Ms. Carolyn. SFX, what did you think? Well, it sounds like a, a very interesting. I plan to watch it as soon as I can. Uh, uh, Visualizing somebody sticking their hand through something, you know, at the, how they would uh, do that. I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, it's. I'm looking forward to actually watching this just to see. Case uh, five O Z T. Very good. Um. I'm sorry, I called on you when I, I mentioned that you hadn't, uh, when you said you hadn't seen the movie. Well, if you get a chance, go watch it. I think you'll enjoy it. It's an interesting film, as you've discovered from the conversation. Let's see here, next on the list, I've got N5BB, Mr. B over in Irving. What did you think of the special effects? This is N5BB. I felt that, as I mentioned earlier, I felt they were good. I really like the uh, the way his hand moved through things, and to me, it was as realistic as they could have made it. It didn't look hokey or anything, and uh, it and the way he actually walked through doors and things. Now, of course, the whole concept is goofy, <laughs> and I agree with the other comments that the fact that his brain was making it happen after the doctor told him he had strong brain waves or something. That was really hokey. <laughs> but the way it was presented with the special effects, I thought, was was fine. I found no problem with that. And they didn't go completely crazy on it. Um, you know, they, they didn't show him actually walking into the bike vault or things like that. And uh, I think it was okay. Uh, by the way, the producer, Jack Harris, uh, the first movies he produced were The Blob and The 4D Plan Man. Another comment is that it's, it seems that this movie was produced a couple years earlier at the same time as The Blob, but they waited a couple years before they released it. It was Patty Duke's first uh, It was not her first movie. Uh, she was about 10 years old. But it was Lee Merriweather's first movie, Inside BB. All right, very good. And that's really interesting stuff. I didn't realize that. Uh, I'll just a quick aside is, is that sometimes we forget that some movies, movies don't come out necessarily one after another in the order of production and the order of time it takes to make them. So it's kind of interesting how some projects get fast-tracked, others get delayed. KG5P, Mike, what did you think of the special effects? out of order anyway. N5HYP, Tom, what did you think of the special effects? KC5ICX on the net, this is N5HYP. 
Um, special effects, like uh, Billy said, were good for the time. Um, it was, um, you know, the 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 uh, uh, masking they did to uh, uh, cover up um, the hand or body parts as they uh, went through the individuals or stuff like that was was, was pretty good. It was fairly passable. Um, and um, you know, I can I agree with the concept that. Um, especially in a movie like this, the question mark at the tail end is the end, and then question mark, could there be more? You never know. Um, was uh, probably good that they didn't re make a sequel to this. And 5 h back to that. Very good, Tom, and I agree. Uh, WB50Z, L, Miss Brenda, special effects. Go ahead. This WB50Z, I thought they were pretty good for the day and for a low budget film. Um, the walking through walls and through furniture um, was pretty cool. But that was pretty good. Since on Wikipedia, Jack Harris was able to begin production of the film with the money he received from uh, dis uh, distributing The Blob in 1958. So, um, if we're to believe that, I guess he made money on The Blob. And, um, yeah, before this movie, Lee Merriweather was Miss America. So she was a beauty queen, uh, but went on to have a very long and distinguished career as an actress. <clears throat> when you mention Shatner is a Comanche, which is so believable, it brings to mind a show I saw once, a made-for-TV pilot that had Shatner as um, Alexander the Great, and it was just dreadful. Um, it, <laughs> Captain Kirk as Alexander the Great just didn't work. So it was it was laughable. I don't know where you could find a copy of it. I had a friend that that had a, a, a video that showed it to us. Uh, okay, I'll turn it back. WB five O Z L. Very good. Let me see. Next up is K five T S K Pearl. Special effects, what do you think? SK5, TSK. I think the special effects were uh, probably what you would expect for that time period. Uh, but, you know, uh, after you go through material and our people, what, what else is there to do? I mean, it, it's... Uh, uh, it, it really didn't give me any, you know, hope for the future, uh, you know, that maybe it could be the Invisible Man. KFI TSK back to that. Very good, Bill. I, I agree. You know what, I'm going to marry two things here. We had the music and we had the special effects. The story was generally well received by everybody here. When we had these other two elements in, the music was distracting, but the special effects were quite good. I agree. I think my favorite scene is when uh, is uh, when um, the character uh, comes in, whose name leaves Scott, I guess, walks in and he walks through walks through the chair very nonchalantly, uh, walks through the or <laughs> goes through the door and starts uh, meeting with the old guy. I thought that was really interesting because it, it's, he has become so comfortable with him, what he's able to do, and now is beginning to become emboldened. Uh, that's very effective. Now, imagine this movie with a good score, say a good orchestral score to go along with it, uh, increasing the tension with the appropriate beats. I think this film could have been much better. Uh, with a good score. In fact, that, that's always been something I've always said about movies. I think scores work extremely well in films uh, and increase and in, in, enhance the uh, 
the uh, tension that goes along with it. Uh, it's meant there to, to emotionally involve the viewer, and I think that could have been a really good turning point and made this film maybe as good as The Blob, maybe better than The Blob in some ways. We're at a little under an hour. I'm going to go ahead and open this up for any discussions that anyone has. So if you have something you would like to say now, I'll just go ahead, just throw your call sign out, and I'll take you in order. Anything you want to say about this movie, uh, go ahead and throw out your call sign now. Agent 5, YBO. Agent 5, Hi, very good. KG5YBO, David, go ahead from KE5ICX. Well, this, uh, this was from the same maker as The Blob, which was one of my favorite scary movies as a kid. I might have to watch the whole, the whole thing. But uh, one thing that strikes me just from you know going through the plans of the movie is blue. Someone had a real penchant for blue in the, uh, in the set design, the backgrounds, the paint colors. Uh, the blouses, the dresses, the shirts, every shade of blue is in this. <laughs> and that, that might annoy me a little voice in the music, uh, but it's an interesting choice. Uh, you basically have that and kind of a ruby red color flashed in variously, but that's pretty much it for color, uh, which is kind of, kind of uh, glaring, I guess, in, in, in a way, as individuals. And uh, for the music score, apparently this was before the days of spotting sessions, <laughs> where you know they actually plan which scenes will require music and which will not. Uh, and I agree, the music does basically provide a, a, a sort of a character to help define the drama better. Uh, Star Wars was done. Uh, impeccably, of course. Rogue One, I've only watched it once because the music was terrible in that, I think. If you look at, uh, for example, Star Wars, the dramatic scene where Obi-Wan Kenobi is fighting Darth Vader, there is no music. From beginning to the end of it, there is no music. And you think maybe there should be, but there's not for a good reason. It leads up to this dramatic scene, you know, uh, at the end where Obi-Wan dies, you just hear a single pluck of a, a cello string and then an overture of music as they escape. And that was very well done. KG5 YBO. Okay, Agent 5 YBO, I, you know what, you brought up a really good point. I put these down in my notes, too, and you're right. So you must be watching the movie or something now or just a little while ago. But, yeah, there was a lot of blue in this film. Uh, whoever the cinematographer was or if the director was thinking in those terms, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, yeah, tons of blue. I would agree with you on that one. And then you mentioned music, and I'll make this one comment because, I, again, this is something really interesting. Bernard Herrmann uh, wrote a lot of music for, well, for the Alfred Hitchcock films. He had a falling out with Alfred Hitchcock at some point, and uh, Hitchcock did not sign him up for uh, the movie The Birds. The Birds, if you watch that film, believe it or not, there is no music in it, none zero, zip, and that was uh, Alfred Hitchcock trying, uh, proving that you don't need music to tell a story. Well, that may be true, and it actually in that style, and being the master uh, 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 director that he was, he was able to do that convincingly. I never even knew that until it was pointed out to me one time when they were, Bernard Herrmann was being interviewed back in the early 70s about that film. So... <laughs> Kind of amazing, isn't it? But I still believe music's better than no music. Okay, additional before we close it out. Anybody got anything? Please come down. This is Terry B. Hall of OZL.
what the heck happened to uh, Ming the Merciless? Killer Kane. And are enlisted to the fight against Kane by Wilma Deering and Dr. Howard. There you have it. This one should be a real winner. It's available over at archive.org. So that's what we're going to go to. Uh, we're going to go watch this coming week. Uh, you can uh, follow along if you go to uh, Facebook, Afterglow Movie. That's two words. If you want to be added to the list, the email list, I do send out the weekly email list with the same information in case you're not a Facebook type. Uh, just send me an email mail at ke5icx at yahoo.com. Kilo Echo 5, India Charlie X-Ray at yahoo.com. And uh, say you want to be on the list, you can also send it to nets at w5fc.org. Either one will get it, and I'll put you on the list. Okay, any final comments before I close it down? Please come in. KF5PDS with a comment. KF5PDS, Ms. Philly, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to mention uh, that a good follow-up movie to 4D Man would be uh, 2008's Jumper, uh, which deals with uh, people that can teleport at will, So, uh, which I'm sure the 4D Man was probably an influence in, on the makers of that film. So I just wanted to throw that out there. If we want to add it to the list, that'd be a good one. It's Jumper from 2008. This is KF5 PDS back to net. Billy, I've got it circled and asterisked, and I will put it on the list. I'll go check and see where we can figure out where we can watch that. But uh, I do have it on the list, and thank you very much. Okay, well, we had, I think we had 10 people, 11 people actually, who checked in or had comments this evening. I want to thank everybody who did check in, and we'll do this again next week. Um, thank you all. Once again, I was looking for my final line. Oh, well, I can't do it uh, next time. Very good. Don't forget, uh, we're two weeks we're talking about going to go see uh, the Apollo 11 spacecraft. Let us know if you would like to join us. I'll try and get it in on Skynet next, next week. So I'll say 7-3 to everybody. Had a good time this evening. I am starting to fade. I had a very long day. So have a good one. I'm headed to the museum tomorrow. Come on by. I'll let you in for free. I got that capability. Uh, the Frontiers of Flight Museum. And I'll take you on my really boring tour if you'd like. Good night, everyone. It's KE5ICX. I'm clear. KE5ICX. RBB. Okay, I'll run back. Go ahead, Bill. You can't have gone very far in three seconds, Tom. Um, man, we're all envious of your superpowers. Uh, I hope you use them for the good of mankind and not for evil. Uh, please sign me up for the Houston trip to Apollo 11 in two weeks, and I will be glad to provide transportation. And my vehicle needs some minor... Uh, work, uh, like plastic uh, fairings and other things like that. So I will be having it in the shop so it will be all up to snuff, ready for visitors inside BB. See ya. <laughs> all right, Bill. Very good. Well, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. We'll, we'll see how it all goes. We may need two two vehicles. Who knows? So I'm going to start promoting it starting now. I should have probably done it earlier, Net, but I, I forgot. Okay. Well
to catch the final few minutes of them blowing up uh, Egypt on Battlestar Galactica. Actually, Caprica, I think, is what it is. So, uh, 7 3. KG5 ICX clear. Okay, Tom. I've seen the museum there, but I think it was 20, maybe 25 years ago. It's been a long time. So, uh, for a for a few years, a cousin of mine was the librarian there at NASA Houston, and so she had access to the research library that had things like uh, old documents and specimens and all kinds of stuff. She then decided the government wasn't paying her enough. She went to work for the Clear Lake Library. The Clear Lake Library then got the contract to maintain the NASA library. So <laughs> the stuff that she had been watching over got moved into her library where she was then. So she's no longer down there, but uh, uh, so she had special powers too, uh, uh, having access to all the old NASA uh, library stuff. Anyway, talk to you later inside the Clear. Hey, Tom. Yeah, I wish I could go on the trip, but I am going to be crowned that day. Um, actually, a tooth crown. So um, I'll be um, sitting in the dentist chair while you guys are watching Apollo 11. <laughs> 73. Okay. You know, you could try to get it rescheduled, but that may or may not be easy. Two weeks out, though, might be possible. So I guess you're doing it on the weekend, so you don't have to take a day off from work. And the following weekend, the 17th, is the Irving Racies face-to-face. -face. So, yet again, we have a lot of activities uh, with the Irving Ham Fest next week. See you, Tom. Uh, and... Uh, uh, hope your plans for the the, uh, the merit badge class go okay. And I hope that one scout shows up. You probably ought to touch base with him a couple of times because if he doesn't show up, then it's going to be kind of bad to have the all the work and nothing to show for it. See you later. Have a good remainder of the weekend. In 5HYP, in 5BB. Oh, and Tom, before I forget, are you going to the Irving Hempfest planning meeting on Monday night? Do you need a ride? Yeah, a couple more. And 5HYP. Hey, Tom, I'll double with you. Do you need a ride to the Irving Hempfest?